Thank you, Ms. Laduete, uh, distinguished members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, since everybody permitted themselves a personal note, I must say I was a little amused about the debate uh, on the Prevention of Terrorism Act. Uh, not that the act is something amusing, but uh, I found myself amused because I'm the only member of the panel and probably the only person in this room who has actually been indicted under the Prevention of Terrorism Act uh, as the first accused and on 14 counts. Uh, one of the other accused was the leader of the EPRLF, K. Patmanaba, who was assassinated by the Tigers. Now, uh, just to dispense with that, as somebody who was indicted under the PTA, I must say that my position is that the PTA should be revised but not repealed. That out of the way, let us uh, return to the topic at hand, uh, the Constitution, uh, Reconciliation and you. Uh, my point of departure is the motto of one of the two organizations that has co-sponsored this seminar. Sri Lanka Inc. and that motto is be the smart change. So what I shall do here as the sole political scientist among lawyers and hard scientists uh, is to try to sketch out what I think is a smart change for post-war Sri Lanka in the 21st century with reference to the constitution and reconciliation. My position is best summed up in the simple sentence with which I opened my article in the island this morning. Sri Lanka needs constitutional change, but not a change of constitution. So I'm not one of those who is satisfied with the status quo. And yes, I do take into account many of the grievances and disaffection that Mr. Sumandaran and Dr. Vigneshwaran articulated here today. But I am far from convinced that this requires an entirely new constitution. In fact, I think that that would be the kind of change that is both unnecessary and downright dangerous. What I argue for is an understanding of the difference between structural change and systemic change. There's a difference between structure and system. The 13th Amendment made for structural change. Provincial councils are a structural reform. I am for autonomy through devolution within the unitary state, and I shall explain why. I have always been uh, of this view. As Dr. Vigneshwaran said, uh, I was uh, a minister, the youngest minister in the provincial council system at the time, a few months younger than Mahinda Samrasinghe, who was the other youngest minister. Uh, so I remain a supporter of the principle of devolution within a unitary framework. But I have always opposed the uh, Chandrika, Bandaranaika, Kumaratunga packages in their several variants, which took us outside and beyond the unitary framework. So if I may sum up, systemic change, no. Structural reform, yes. And this is a fundamental distinction between reform and replacement. Why do I say that the constitution should not be replaced? or repealed? And why do I say that the Constitution must be reformed? I say that the Constitution must not be repealed because we have to look at it, and I do so as a political scientist, as a system. What we have is a particular system of state. And that system of state is democratic, it is a republic in which sovereignty is vested in the people. It has a presidential system uh, of leadership, of governance, uh, and it is a unitary form of state. That is the constellation or the ensemble of features that go up to make the state system that we have in Sri Lanka. Now, the 1987 change 
introduced a structural reform into that state system. Why do I say that the state system must not be replaced? Because, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a success. Now, we are told that there's something radically wrong with Sri Lanka, that therefore you need to scrap the state system, you need to scrap the constitution, that we have failed. I ask myself, in comparison to whom or what? Because from the time, at least, of Aristotle, we are taught, as students of politics, that any informed judgment must be based on a comparative analysis. Now, there is this strange uh, view that the United National Party sometimes has, uh, which is to compare with Singapore, which is a, an admirable place, but it's a city-state. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not really a, it doesn't have a rural hinterland, it's not a country. But let's try to be more realistic in our comparisons. East Asia, which is that which we are compared, or we compare ourselves with, is, is not a valid comparison. These are countries with A, a Confucian cultural matrix, and B, which had decades of harsh military dictatorships, uh, sometimes leading to millions dead, as in Indonesia, uh, which were uh, military dictatorships which were the byproduct of the Cold War. Uh, these areas also had the benefit of massive U.S. Uh, inflows of investment in the attempt to contain China during the Cold War. Now, we avoided that. We have always maintained our democracy. So, East Asia is neither desirable nor viable as a point of comparison. But if you look at the rest of the world, and, and by which I start with India and the terrible system of social apartheid which is caste, through Pakistan with its violent terrorism uh, and separatism in Baluchistan, through the Middle East, with all those failed and shattered states thanks to Western intervention uh, and uh, Islamist radical terrorism, uh, sweeping through parts of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, the fall of Yugoslavia, the civil wars in Georgia and in Ukraine, down to uh, Latin America with the uh, unimaginably violent gangs in, in Mexico and Colombia and El Salvador, I tell myself that Sri Lanka has been a success. We have prevailed over the world's most powerful terrorist movement at that time. We have sent back 70,000 foreign troops and restored our sovereignty. We have retained a competitive democratic system. We have retained social welfare. And we have fought off uh, conspiracies of the far right, such as the military coup conspiracy of 1962, and two southern ultra-leftist insurrections. We are a success as a state. We recovered faster from the tsunami than Louisiana did from Katrina. So I refuse to believe that we are failure and that our state system, our state form, has to be replaced. The replacement that is sought ladies and gentlemen, is in two realms. One, the abolition of the executive presidency. Two, the abolition or the transcendence of the unitary form of state. I think that both would be disastrous and they're certainly uncalled for. Ladies and gentlemen, of the five permanent members of the Security Council, four have presidential systems. And they're different in every other way. The United States, Russia, China, France. Only Great Britain has its own Westminster model, the parliamentary system. If you take the continent of the Americas, except for Canada, which was a British colony at one time, uh, the United States and Latin America, that includes Cuba, uh, and the whole of Latin America have executive presidencies. And that is because the founding fathers of the United States and a rather different founding father, the, reuni the unifier of Latin America, Simon Bolivar, had the same idea that a strong elected leadership, an executive presidency, is necessary for what they called new nations. So, why should we in Sri Lanka 
throw away the executive presidency, which four of the five members of the permanent uh, the permanent members of the Security Council had. I think it is something that has been quite rightly bequeathed to us by President Jayawardena, and I think we should retain it. We have made modifications by way of the 19th Amendment, and that's enough. We can revisit the question in another 10 or 20 years. Ladies and gentlemen, when President Jayawardena canvassed for the executive presidential system in December 1966, when he was uh, Minister of, ja uh, of Dudley Sananayake, Prime Minister of Sananayake's government, it was not for national security, it was for economic development. He called for a strong and stable executive free from the whims and fancies of the legislature. And it is that executive presidency, ladies and gentlemen, that enabled us to have an open economic policy uh, more than 15 years before India, and have a growth rate of, even, of around 5% even during the worst of the war when bombs were going off in Colombo. Just think for a moment what would have happened if we did not have a presidential system. If we didn't, if Chandrika Bandarana and Kumar Tunga weren't the president, Rana Vikram Singh would have handed the North and East over to the Tigers under the CFA. He was thrown out because Chandrika had the executive power to intervene. If we didn't have the executive presidency, we would have been so dependent on parliament that any change in the parliamentary arithmetic, which could have been engineered by LTT black money, would have put an end to the war which liberated us from terrorism. I mean, it's because Mahindra Rajapaksa was president that that was not done. I can go on. I mean, uh, Rana Singh and Premadasa and so on and so forth. So, if we didn't have the executive presidency today, if Prime Minister Vikram Singh's original draft of the 19th Amendment that he sent to the Supreme Court but was thrown out by the Supreme Court, uh, if that had prevailed, if that model had prevailed, then Arjuna Mahendran would still be the governor of the Central Bank and the bond scam would probably still be going on. It is because President Sirisena had even the truncated powers under the 19th Amendment that he was able to intervene and he replaced the governor and put in Indrajit Kumaraswamy. Imagine what Sri Lanka would be if you did not have the executive presidency today. And all power was in the hands of the present prime minister, which is what will happen if we implement this proposal tomorrow, the new uh, system, the new constitution. Is that what we want? You've seen what Vigneshwaran has done, and I don't mean Dr. Vigneshwaran. You've seen the way he behaves. It's not just personal, because Varadaraja Peruma did the same thing. He did the same thing. And before the council sat in its first session, it already condemned the 13th Amendment as insufficient. How did they know? How did we know? I resigned after a few months. How did we know that there weren't enough powers before we started exercising them? It's not, it's not really to demonize Vigneshwaran. It's to do with the political culture of the place. That is why Marxists like the EPRLF, when they took office in the northeastern province, they became ultra-nationalists. It's the political culture of the place that is influenced daily from Tamil Nadu through its media. Do you want a system in which you are going to give more powers to the northern and eastern provinces? You saw how the chief minister of the eastern province treated the navy officer. You saw how Vigneshwaran went over to the eastern province, marched, and called for the removal of the military, the Sri Lankan military, from two provinces of Sri Lanka, which were battle zones for 30 years. The North and East, he did that a couple of weeks ago. I mean, even with, with children or in personal relations, if somebody treats you badly, do you reward that person with more power over you? You don't. You have to be lunatic to do that. We have to be crazy. If we shift a significant and qualitative amount of power to the northern and eastern provinces, if this is the way they behave now, imagine what they will do if they have more power and if the governor doesn't have any power. Imagine what would happen here in the rest of the country if Prime Minister Vikramasinghe had more power than he has now and Maitipala Sirisena 
were deemed a lame duck president. Because even if they say that the system will take effect at the end of his first term, he will be a lame duck the moment it's announced, the moment the constitution is adopted. Is that what we want? Are we crazy to want that? No. What we have is a successful state. It's a strong state. It defeated the most powerful terrorist organization in the world. It has been more successful in fighting terrorism than the United States has. It saw off 70,000 foreign troops. It's not that I didn't hear what Dr. Vignesaran was saying. He's saying, do you want the Indians to come and sort you out? Well, they tried. And we refused to go beyond the 13th Amendment. 70,000 troops and we refused to go beyond the 13th Amendment, even with that gun pressed to our heads. With the Tigers exploding bombs in Colombo, we refused to go beyond the 13th Amendment. We refused to be cowed. Why should we, having prevailed over all those threats, external and internal, Get on our knees and convert to federalism, which we refuse to do when we were dying every day. This is a Ravana nation. But with a Vibhishana government. We should not go beyond the 13th Amendment. It is true that we can be subject to external pressure if we are stupid. For instance, if as some extremists say we try to repeal the 13th Amendment, if we go for zero devolution, if we try to turn the clock back, then what happened to Georgia and the Ukraine could happen to us. That is why, as a realist, I am totally opposed to any idea of 13 minus, of diluting the 13th Amendment, because we can't get away with it. But even the notorious, repugnant UNHRC resolution of 2015, which would never have been possible if the government, the last government wasn't stupid enough to remove me from Geneva, even in that wretched resolution of 2015, there is no mention of anything beyond the 13th Amendment, even in the Geneva resolution. So there is no external, legitimate external pressure that we go beyond the implementation of the 13th Amendment. But we cannot scrap the 13th Amendment either because that would invite external intervention. But so long as we don't do that, which is the mistake Milosevic made with the autonomous status of Kosovo, that is to try to turn the clock back, then we have a legitimate basis on which to resist any external pressure whatsoever. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you can imagine a situation in which we give India the oil tank farms, which we are not, we are not, it's not necessary to do because the annexures to the Indo Lanka Accord only said that we won't allow the oil tank farms of Trincomalee to be used by a power hostile to India. We didn't promise to give them the oil tank farms. But now that this Vibhishana Prime Minister is talking about a land bridge to Tamil Nadu and allowing India to develop Palali. Can you imagine a situation in which India is given the oil tank farms and the council is given more power than it has now? How long would it take? How many years for a natural process of osmosis and for us to lose that area? We have to be crazy to even think about these things. It just should not be done. It's crazy. This is a small island, and if, instead of the Sinhalese, you had the Tamils in the same place that the Sinhalese are now, if the Tamils had only this island, where they were the majority in the whole world, on the whole planet, and if the Sinhalese were in the north, and the Sinhalese are 80 million co-ethnics in Kerala, I would be making the same point I'm going to make. So it has nothing to do with Sinhalese and Tamils, it has to do with political science, it is to do with logic and it is to do with fair play. You have a community which is 74% of this place. This place is a small island, no neighbors. Nowhere else in the world do you have that particular community in large numbers speaking the language with roots there. Unlike the Tamils who have such roots in Malaysia, South Africa, Tamil Nadu, 80 million 
co-ethnics. In such a situation, geopolitically, we must not entertain notions of going beyond the unitary state form. Now, this point was made not by a single Buddhist chauvinist. By the way, I'm not a single Buddhist chauvinist. I'm, I'm not a Buddhist to start with. But this point was best made by Dr. Colvin R. De Silva in 1972, when, you must remember, that as a historian, he had won the prize, the history prize in the whole of the British Empire at one point. Uh, he made the point that our history, the history of this island, is one of incursions, and incursions which are made possible because of internal fragmentation. And therefore, he opposed, as a Marxist and a historian, he opposed a federal system. Why, ladies and gentlemen, did Karl Marx and Frederick Engels oppose the federalism that the great anarchist Mihail Bakunin proposed? Why was Lenin opposed to a federal system? Were they singular Buddhists? No. Why are most countries in the world unitary? Including those that have ethno-regional problems such as the Philippines. In our specific situation, we need the unitary form of state. We need to protect ourselves against the centripetal dynamics and the irredentist dynamics of having 80 million co-ethnics of our brethren in the north and east across 18 miles of water in Tamil Nadu. We have to protect ourselves against that. That's not going to change. This government will go. But geography and history are not going to change. So, what then is the solution. We need structural reform. We need to understand that if the Tamil people feel that they are living under the Sinhalese, they are not going to want to live with the Sinhalese. You can't ride roughshod over there. But I think that the solution is at hand. The solution is a mix of the reasonable devolution of power within the unitary system and the elimination of discrimination through a Bill of Rights. That's the combination. That's what I propose. That's structural reform. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had the 13th Amendment in place for 30 years. The Provincial Council hasn't worked for a long time because you've had the Civil War. Gamini uh, Javikrama Pereira raises the question just a few weeks ago, and he's a UN player. He said, I developed the Northwestern Province under the 13th Amendment, and I have Chief Minister, why can't the others do it? The answer, of course, is that development and serving their people is not what is being talked about. It's something else. What, what is being sought here is some kind of redefinition of Sri Lanka as multinational and non-unitary. That won't work. Multinational, you know, that's fine for Nepal or, or Bolivia, where you have, you know, 60%, 40%. 60, 40, or uh, 55, 35, 25. But in any country, I mean, if, if the Tamil people were 74%, I would say that, and then the Sinhalese were 10, I would say it's not a multinational country. Even the Indo Lanka Accord defines Sri Lanka as a multi ethnic country, not a multinational country. So this is not multinational. Uh, the Tamil people are not a nationality, they're a national minority. Now, they are. They do feel aggrieved and discriminated against. So what I'm saying is have a double barrel solution. Re-examine 30 years of experience with the 13th Amendment, including in the other provinces. Change some clauses if you have to. Look at the concurrent list and, and think in terms of swaps, not the abolition of the concurrent list. In that way, you can come up with the equivalent of the 19th Amendment. You can modify, revise, reform, renovate, rectify the 13th Amendment. You have a constituency already. The provincial councils in the south will not agree to the repeal of the 13th Amendment. There's no way that will happen. So you've got a bulwark. It's not to do with Indian pressure. It's to do with a, a constituency in the south. You have shareholders. Let's look at that and get the joint opposition on board. I was particularly amused that uh, Mr. Sumandran found J.O., uh, very amusing, and this is from a man whose party has 16 seats. The JO has more than three times the number of seats of the TNA, and the TNA is not ashamed to call itself the, the opposition. 
I mean, the opposition is what you call the alternative government. Is the TNA going to be the next government in this country? I don't mean in Tamil Elam, I mean in this country. No, it's a joint opposition someday that's going to be the, the next government. So it's the alternative government. You need the JO on board because otherwise you're going to have your constitution repealed. So if you have the JO and the SLFP and the UNP, you can all agree as you did concerning the 19th Amendment except for Rear Admiral Vira Sekra here who was a courageous loner, but I support those who supported the 19th Amendment. You can have a rectification of the 13th Amendment. You can improve it. You can remove its dysfunctionalities that Dr. Vigneshwaran was talking about. And you can supplement that with something that's very dear to my heart because I, the, the report on the uh, review conference of the Durban uh, conference of 2001, the review conference 10 years later was about the Durban conference, conference which was the UN conference which produced uh, a program of action against racism, racial discrimination, and xenophobia. Uh, that report went to New York under my name because I was the chairperson, as uh, Ms. Ladwati said, of the uh, Intergovernmental Working Group in Geneva. Now, let us use the Durban Declaration. Let us use the documents produced by the Special Rapporteur of the UN on Minority Rights. And let's rectify the Sri Lankan constitution so that any kind of discrimination is eliminated and that you have a strong ombudsman who can deal, who can intervene in matters of discrimination. I call that Solbury Plus or Solbury Plus Plus because the guarantees were removed in 72 and that was a huge mistake. So this is my suggestion of a smart change, of a structural change which can be effected with uh, an all-parties consensus in uh, the House, in the Parliament. And uh, if, however, we are faced with this prospect of a new constitution, a systemic change which deletes the unitary character uh, in form or content and abolishes the executive presidency, I strongly urge, I strongly urge uh, Sri Lankan society to... Uh, do to that draft at the referendum what the Sri Lankan cricketers did in the 2020 match that we won a few days ago. Thank you. We think of time as a one-way motion. From the past to the present and on to the future. But the future is always a result of what has happened in the past. What we decide today will impact our future beyond our lifetime. What is the future we wish to create? What is the legacy we wish to leave behind? Can we be the change we wish to see? Let us chat with the future today. Be the smart change.